Welcome everyone to another capsule international relations for the Shankar IAS Academy. We have reached the end of the year 2021. And what I'd like to do is to have an overview of the year from the perspective of foreign policy and foreign affairs. Most of the developments of the year, we have already dealt with in detail. But the idea is to link them all together and see what exactly has been the major impact of 2021 in geopolitics. So the most inevitable topic is the pandemic itself. In fact, 2021 will go down in history as the most frustrating and the most disappointing year in recent years. 2020 was a horrible year, but we are all expecting that by the end of the 2020, the pandemic might start disappearing and that 2021 will usher in a new era or go back to the old era. In fact, there were some indications that this was go, this was so in the beginning of the year and uh, till about the summer of 2021. But from summer 2021, the year became even much worse than that of 2020 from the pandemic point of view, particularly in India. India became the biggest uh, uh, contributor to corona uh, disease and deaths in the world. And uh, there were shortages, uh, problems, funeral pyres were seen unattended, people were dying near the hospitals. It was the most horrible scenes that we saw in India and also elsewhere. And then towards the end of the year, things started looking better. And then comes Omicron, about which we don't know enough. So 2021 is ending on a sad note in the sense that the uncertainty facing, the huma facing humanity is continuing. We do not know what 2022 would be like, uh, but hopefully things will be better in the new year as we had expected in 2021. So the main uh, issue continued to be for humanity an existential threat. And uh, vaccines were found, areas were found for international cooperation by uh, different bodies, and things were structured after almost one year of totally disorganized dealing with the pandemic. So things are in place, and therefore now there is a sense uh, that even if there is another wave of a new uh, virus, we will still be able to manage it. And also there is news that the, the, the new virus is not as deadly as the previous one, even though it may be more infectious. Well, we have to see. So from the point of view of for those who follow international affairs, the point to note is that 2021 was as difficult as 2022, but there are some hopes raised and 2021 kind of stabilized the situation with regard to the uh, pandemic. And 2022 may well be the end of the pandemic because the latest strain seems to be in accordance with the regular plans of pandemic. Towards the end, it becomes very infectious, but then slowly dies out. Anyway, so but so the whole world was the world affairs were dominated by the pandemic. Whichever body or whichever group met during the year 2021, efforts were made to coordinate it. Of course, the United Nations still did not take an all UN approach, which they had taken in the case of HIV AIDS, etc. It is still with WHO, with uh, other countries and groups uh, trying to. Uh, do its best. The second most important thing that happened in 2021 was the change of administration in the United States. But unfortunately, it was also the time when you, in the United States, democracy was called into question in a big way. All of you remember on January, 20, January 6th, before President Biden uh, was declared as the candidate in the joint session of the US Congress, there was an insurrection, uh, certainly motivated by the outgoing president himself, 
who did not want to believe that he had lost the election. And he called for this resurrection, literally. And this was the darkest moment in United States history as a democracy. Because every principle of democracy was violated. Elections were declared um, fair by all the authorities concerned. But a desperate effort was made uh, by the supporters of President Trump by physically entering the US Capitol and stopping the vice president uh, from formalizing the results. But there was some bloodshed and there were a lot of huge crowds, so very serious uh, uh, dereliction of duty by the, by the uh, law and order officials. But in spite of all that, uh, the vice president prevailed and we had uh, the results announced and President Biden took over. But the tragedy of it is that even after one year, even today, Republicans and the Democrats are still divided after the elections. Because normally, after the elections, there is a kind of period of honeymoon when both the parties would work together and try to frame an agenda for the nation. But that did not happen. In fact, there was no honeymoon because Everybody protested, and the Republicans protested. Not only the hardcore one, but even the so-called moderate Republicans protested against the results. And there has not been a single uh, instance of the two parties working together. Everything is uh, being fought hard in the Senate and the Congress. In the Senate, Democrats have uh, uh, equal numbers. And with the vote of the speaker, they can carry any decision. And the Congress, they have a small minority, small majority. And now the elections are coming in 2022, the midterm elections, when some of the, or the, some of the seats in both the houses. And there will be a very tough fight because President Trump and his party are still very actively campaigning for the next election and even for 2024. So this was an absolute disgrace to. Um, the United States, and um, uh, but the proce procedures went on. President Trump left Washington, and with that, it was possible for things to move. And I must say, President Biden moved very fast. On the first day itself, he, he re-entered the Paris Agreement, announced that he would join the negotiations for the Iran nuclear deal and various other things like immigration and so on. He, he took action on the first day itself. But somehow his presidency did not take off in, in spite of all his effort, uh, primarily because of this background of the elections and also because the, the pandemic was a big threat. He had to correct the mistakes made by his predecessor and that took a lot of his time with vaccines and masks and social distancing, etc. And uh, the rejection of vaccines by a large number of Americans still prevails, even though vaccination has been uh, uh, has been uh, continued very effectively, but still a major, um, a vast, a big minority of the people of the United States are still vaccine hesitant. And uh, what does not happen elsewhere, there it is not only the non, it's not the non-availability of vaccines, uh, but the reluctance of people to take the vaccine in spite of the fact that the new virus is increasing very rapidly in the, in the United States. But he also took on various uh, important international assignments and uh, foreign policy. Uh, the two rivals he identified, Russia and China, he had face-to-face uh, -face discussions with uh, President Putin in Geneva, and also he had a, a virtual meeting with President Xi. And both these were very important meetings in which he tried to develop his own policy towards these two countries. He said that both are rivals, but at the same time, he urged that these differences between the two countries, between the two of them, both of all of the the three of them uh, should not uh, reach a stage of conflict. Things should be um, settled peacefully 
and uh, while rivalry con 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 continues, there is no need for a conflict at any stage. And that the other two also seem to agree. And therefore, there is no immediate danger of a war, not even a cold war, because they all said that they did not want a cold war. But that, I, I believe, is not avoidable because there's already a cold war in that sense, uh, because they are acting at uh, cross purposes. And the Ukraine crisis has added another dimension uh, to US relations with, uh, with the Moscow. So all these we have discussed in detail, but uh, simply to, uh, uh, to flag the second uh, uh, major development of the year. Um, Biden as president, uh, the general impression is that he is trying very hard, but he's not making a headway. And uh, his popularity has uh, uh, gone down ever since he took over, and uh, that itself that it remains a, a question mark. And uh, what will happen in 2022 and what will happen in 2024 remain as uh, as questions. Uh, whether he'll be a candidate in spite of his age, and whether President Trump, former President Trump, will be a, um, a candidate in 2024, or all these. Uh, open questions. Um, China, in his in, uh, President Xi's talks with uh, President Biden, uh, challenged the whole question of the uh, United States claiming to be the champion of democracy. Because uh, unlike in the previous years, China has taken on this mission of proving that China itself is a, is a democracy. And not only a democracy, but the biggest democracy in the world. And they claim that they have elections, they follow things democratically, etc. And so they are not only challenging the, the Western system of democracy, but also claiming that they are, that they are a democracy. So the situation is still very, very much in a flux. Nobody knows who the, uh, you know, the leader of the world will be. United States has repeatedly declared that the United States is back, but uh, various other issues will come to Afghanistan later. And all these are still creating a lot of trouble for President Biden. As well as the Ch uh, China is concerned, the next uh, most important development of the year, as well as India is concerned, there has been a hardening of the Chinese position on the line of actual control in India. They have um, uh, stopped the disengagement process, even though dialogue is continuing at different levels. And we have even had several meetings with the Chinese present on various occasions. But in spite of all that, there is no progress at all on the question of disengagement. And um, meanwhile, there have been several news items from inside China. The 19th Communist uh, Party Congress took very major decisions, um, like uh, continuing with uh, socialism with Chinese characteristics, and uh, more than that, upholding the leadership of President Xi. All, all party members agreed to work in unison under the helmsman, the new name given to him as the great leader, and um, a grand resolution was passed by the Communist Party Congress. It was the third resolution of this kind in 100 years, once in 1945 by Mao Zedong, another in 1978 by Deng Xiaoping, and now 2021 by Xi Jinping, saying basically that Xi Jinping is now the legitimate leader, unquestioned leader, and um, all others were sidelined and um, definitely uh, he will get uh, another term next year and this would be unusual and we do not know whether there will be any other developments which will prevent this because recently there have been two articles which appeared in china by think tanks 
one in which Xi Jinping was not even mentioned. And uh, this paper talked more about Deng Xiaoping and his other predecessors. So this created some uh, flutter in the China watchers as to what this means. Because on the one hand, he has been kind of, um, you know, declared president for the future, maybe for life. And at the same time, uh, uh, an authentic document came out in which he is not even mentioned. And Deng Xiaoping's you know, achievements were highlighted. That we don't know whether it is a plan, something else, but that is also to be noted. Uh, so we'll have to wait till the, the Congress itself meeting in uh, 2022. Uh, but meanwhile, of course, we have also discussed various reforms of President Xi Jinping moving a little bit backward from uh, the, the capitalistic economic system and, uh, you know, uh, declaring, making uh, many big wigs, many billionaires poor by withdrawing the support to them and trying to divide the wealth among the ordinary uh, people. The next uh, important uh, development was the operationalizing of the Quad. On the one hand, as China is moving forward, uh, United States gave new life to Quad. Quad, as you know, was um, first talked about in uh, 2004, and it was reluctantly pursued. But with the arrival of uh, President Biden, and also because of the increase in the Chinese threat in the Indian Ocean, um, the President Biden declared that this will be a a group of democratic partners who share a world, world view and have a common vision for the future, for a free and open India-Pacific. But in the process of discussion and also the meetings, finally, the final one in, the, in Washington itself, some changes took, took place in the nature of, uh, of Quad, because many people thought that it was a military alliance, but disguised as uh, kind of dialogue, but maybe because of the reluctance of India, etc. The agenda changed. The agenda moved on to uh, rule of law, freedom of navigation and overflights, peaceful resolution of disputes, democratic values, and territorial integrity of states, COVID vaccines, climate change, clean energy, energy technologies. So a number of other agenda items of a uh, peaceful developmental nature were added to the um, Quad, particularly because of India's hesitation to join any kind of, uh, of alliance. So Quad got established very much in that process, but its agenda became a bit blurred because even though it is anti-Chinese in its substance because of the in uh, Chinese influence, increasing influence in uh, Indo-Pacific, uh, but the military nature was somewhat played down after the Washington meeting. And the reason for it is that there was a new uh, military alliance which was formed on the 15th of September, 2021, what is called AUKUS, that is Australia, UK, and US. You may wonder why they have to be an alliance, because they're already in alliances of various kinds. They are Western powers. But um, I think uh, this was formalized into a, into a military alliance in the context of, of uh, the Quad taking on more civilian responsibilities. But I presume they'll link together if in case of there are any, any crisis. Uh, but of course, we all know that the purpose of AUKUS was very specific. This was to give capability to Australia for nuclear-powered submarines. Because so far in the world, only UK and US, of course, apart from Russia, which have the uh, capability to build nuclear-armed submarines, sorry, nuclear-powered submarines, not nuclear-armed. And, uh, but the crisis arose because with this meant that when the Australians shifted to a nuclear-driven powered 
um, nuclear powered submarines then they had to cancel a huge billion dollar agreement reached with france so france was very angry it withdrew the ambassadors from uk and uh, us protested made a made havoc about uh, AUKUS, basically because they have their business where interests were affected. But then the realization came that these submarines are going to come about only in about 20 years. So France did not have to get so agitated about it and therefore there is some amount of uh, peace established there. But the Chinese government went uh, frontally to attack uh, AUKUS, calling it an extremely irresponsible, seriously undermines regional peace and stability. And that's a, that really the language of alliances. Even New Zealand was not very happy with AUKUS because New Zealand believes that the South Pacific, where these countries, Australia and uh, New Zealand are located, is a nuclear free zone, nuclear weapon free zone, but uh, introducing nuclear powered submarines into this region is against the spirit of a nuclear weapon free zone. And New Zealand has also expressed uh, uh, some kind of concern that such, a, such an alliance has been, has been established. And France was, of course, more worried about uh, um, its own financial uh, situation. And they are also in the South Pacific and therefore they have a, a concern about what is happening in the Indo-Pacific. And, uh, but of course, the, why this happened was because of the deterioration of the relations between Australia and China. Australia was a good friend of China, but recent events have shown that they have, to, they have decided to break away from their special relationship uh, with China. And that was also one of the reasons why the US-UK partnership was strengthened with Australia, because Australia felt threatened in the new situation. So, so Quad and AUKUS were major developments of 2021. Then, of course, Afghanistan, which, as we know, uh, has been uh, the biggest uh, uh, event of 2021, after, of course, the other four things that I, I mentioned. And uh, so Afghanistan uh, was not expected to explode like this uh, because a certain agreement was reached with Taliban for the Americans to withdraw. President Trump himself had established it. And President Biden just followed all those decisions, continued the discussions with the Taliban. And then finally, what he did was to declare a date by which United States will leave. And that decision was obviously not the taken with uh, considerable thought. And, um, and then having declared September 11 as the day, September um, 9, 11 as the day on which he, finally the Americans leave, President Biden advanced it a little bit and the soldiers left in August itself. And uh, leaving the country uh, for the Taliban and the so-called Afghan forces built by the Americans to fight it out. And President Biden said that it will take uh, three months, four months, six months, one year for Taliban to be cleared. Uh, but lo and behold, that is not what happened. Uh, without any, without firing a shot, Taliban was able to occupy Kabul and took over power and formed a cabinet and went along in spite of a small uh, protest by the former president in Panjshir Valley. It was also put down by force, and a proper regular government was formed in Afghanistan about their policies. They were a bit vague, but they were generally saying that all people will be treated as equal, and there will be no criminalization of any activity. Uh, women will be given their due place, but all under Sharia law and the interpretation of Sharia law we knew, we saw in practice. Uh, was not what they were talking about. So this has created a grave concern in the whole world, particularly United States and India, because China, Russia, Pakistan, Taliban, uh, kind of an axis has been formed. 
And uh, even though no country in the world has so far recognized Afghanistan government, uh, they are dealing with them. Discussions are being take pla taking place. And for humanitarian assistance, even India has joined. Though we have not uh, returned our mission to Kabul, but, Afghanistan, but uh, Russia and China and Iran are already operating from Kabul. So in our case, the worst uh, impact will be on us because uh, terrorism in, uh, in Afghanistan is a major threat to India, uh, particularly in Jammu and Kashmir. And uh, Pakistan will use the opportunity to heighten tension in uh, Jammu and Kashmir because they want to wreak vengeance for Article 370. And we have, of course, uh, uh, started uh, discussions with everyone. In fact, one special thing I noticed about India's foreign policy in 2021 uh, was that we were willing to have universal engagement. So there have been several instances of our being engaged in different groups in which we do not have full support of all the members, like SCEO, for example. We attended the meeting. Some members of the SCO held another meeting and took another decision as against the group. We called a meeting of the national security advisors of the region, because Pakistan did not come. But um, we took the initiative to do certain things at the national security advisors level. We called a meeting of the Central Asian countries. And we even attended a, uh, a meeting where Russia, China, and India were present. And um, so wherever there was an opportunity, India has begun a very active diplomatic effort with regard to Ladakh on the one hand and China on the other. Sorry, and, uh, and uh, Afghanistan on the other. So India was compelled, as it were, to energize its diplomacy to a great extent. And uh, that has resulted in a lot of meetings and the impression that India is willing to uh, talk to everyone and anyone. And, in, and uh, I would say that from a kind of um, uh, in selective, uh, selective alliances or selective alignments, we have even moved on to some kind of universal conversations uh, with anyone we can or is interested in the future of the world. And the latest in this practice is the most unexpected visit by the Indian Foreign Secretary to, um, to Myanmar. Uh, we do recognize Myanmar, of course, and, uh, but nobody in the world has, uh, uh, has recognized or reconciled to what they have been doing in the last one year. Aung San Suu Kyi is still in prison. And uh, for the Indian Foreign Secretary to go there at this time, looked, appeared a little bit unusual. But he was received at the highest level. Discussions were held. Apparently, the Foreign Secretary talked about the need for return to democracy. And he also wanted to meet Aung San Suu Kyi. That was not permitted. So this visit was a tough one as to what the Foreign Secretary should say to a dictator. To go to a dictator and tell him, please give up your dictatorship is not something very pleasant. And, um, but anyway, this meeting took place. We have to wait and see whether it has an impact on the military dictatorship. ASEAN is also active, and we have said that we will work together with, uh, uh, with ASEAN as we, as we go on. So, uh, India, as I said, is very much uh, disadvantaged in the Afghanistan situation. And that is one reason why Indian diplomacy has been very active. Our external affairs minister has been traveling to various capitals in spite of the pandemic. And uh, we cannot say that we have gained anything specifically, either on the question of Ladakh or on the question of Afghanistan. Things are not moving in the way we want it, but uh, we uh, keep persisting. So these are the issues that I wanted to highlight in this session. And uh, we will probably, we have one more session before the end of the year. And there we'll deal with some of the other developments of 2021. So what I'd like to do is to um, stop here with a general 
assessment of the year. As I first said earlier, hopes were belied the beginning. It was, uh, but the country year turned out to be as tragic as 2020 with reference to India, particularly. But the, some, uh, some silver lining was, of course, vaccines as the key. And, but at the same time, now we hear about uh, something which would defy the vaccine. So uh, we have a problem in Ladakh and um, we are tackling these questions continuously and uh, we still have to wait for it. So 2021 was not a good year for the world and not for India. Many things remain to be tackled. So in the remaining time, if you have any questions, we can deal with them and uh, we'll do another review of some of the remaining issues in the next session. Thank you very much.